thank you so very much for joining us tonight. We have a great presentation planned. And uh, my name is John Tolson. I'm with the uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I'm going to be the um, kind of the moderator and get things started. Uh, we do this on a monthly basis. We have uh, uh, a different uh, person from the different faiths here in Simi Valley do presentations. Um, and then at the end, we can do some questions and answers. You can put those questions and answers in the bottom, either in the chat or in the Q&A at the bottom. Uh, tonight, we have a very special guest, uh, Reverend Stephen Rambo. Reverend Stephen Rambo is honored and excited to serve the Center for Spiritual Living Simi Family after having been at Founders Church of Religious Science for over 10 years. He is a licensed minister of, relig of religious science for the Centers for Spiritual Living. Reverend Stephen is guided by two mottos, be yourself because everybody else is taken, and you are the garden living in a field of infinite possibilities. He believes in and focuses much of his attention on community engagement. Community is the next frontier for the science of mind teaching. It's time to apply the philosophy and practices that have positively changed our individual lives to make positive changes in our community. Reverend Stephen serves on the Centers for Spiritual Living Regeneration Committee, charged with recruiting emerging adults, 18 to 35 year olds, into religious science ministry. He is also a, minister, a member of the Science of Mind Archives and Library Foundation Board and serves on the CSL Events Committee re responsible for planning the annual Center for Spiritual Living conventions. Going by the more casual Steve Rambo, he was a weather forecaster and environmental reporter for KCBS TV2 for over a decade. In the years since television, Reverend Stephen devoted time to his spiritual calling, becoming a licensed practitioner, returning to school to earn a bachelor's degree in liberal studies and theology from Antioch University and being awarded a master's degree from the Holmes Institute for Consciousness Studies. His personal mission and joy is to lovingly honor, encourage, and support your growth as you harvest from your field the highest good and the innermost being, beingness inherent within you. Reverend Stephen loves camping and nature. He and his partner, Joanna Van Gelder, sp like spending time at the beach, biking, motorcycling, reading, gardening, and cooking. <laughs> and, and, you know, uh, I have had a, an enjoyable mm, maybe three years plus or so of just being good friends with Stephen, Reverend Stephen, and he's always uh, accessible and uh, willing to do whatever he can. And when it says he's in, deep into community, he is. So what we're going to do at the time is turn it over to you, Reverend Stephen. Thank you for joining us. Well, th thank you, John. That was fun to, to listen to that and to realize that I mentioned to you earlier today, uh, let's let's get that off of the website. So I'm so grateful you read that because I need to go to the website and do some updates. Uh, I'm not on the events committee anymore, but uh, but I but all that other stuff is is true. And to hear some of that to remind me of my mission, my calling, and the honor with which I get to serve, uh, including being on the Simi Valley Interfaith uh, Council and working with my other colleagues in the community, because what we've come to understand and something that, that we teach in our teaching is, uh, as our teacher, Dr. Holmes tells us, our founder, uh, there's one life, that life is God, that life is my life now, that life is your life now. And what we see from the interfaith journey is the God by many names. But there's one common purpose that we can find within all, and that is the impulsion of love that pushes us forward. And that's what I love about you, John, is that you exhibit that idea of love and your community. The LDS community in Simi Valley and the Thousand Oaks State both are so deeply involved in helping us to understand that the message of what we, who we call the Great Wayshore, 
the great example, not the exception, but the great example, and that is Jesus, who leads the name of your organization, came here to teach us a way of being in life. And a lot of other faiths have found other things that Jesus brings to us. And that's the beauty of the deep message that he had. There was so much to it. But at the core of it, ye shall do greater things than I. The Father and I are one. And those understandings of the religious principles is what Dr. Holmes distilled in what we call the science of mind and spirit. Uh, it's a faith system that's called a science because science is how things work. And it's called science of mind because Dr. Holmes, our founder, decided that mind was another name for him, for God. He also calls it the thing itself, the great intelligence, the divine presence, many different names. But mind is that everyone lives within the consciousness. We all, if you, if everybody right here, right now, just sort of, let's just take a moment. Take a breath and feel within your body. There's something happening here. We're talking listening, watching, participating. And while that's happening, the blood is circulating, the energy is there, there's something animating our system. And that, that animating system is the infinite intelligence of the universe as the science of mind teaches. That is the mind of God being made manifest in a physical time space experience by means of you. Individualized expressions of the only thing that is. And that's a very much at the core Now it should be back again. Okay. All right. Yeah. Hey, you gotta love live. <laughs> it keeps us present being in the live experience. So um, where should we take this conversation? There's so many different ways to go. And there's so much that I, that I could begin to tell you. Let's start with this guy that I've talked about, this guy named Ernest Holmes, who was uh, born in a small town in Maine. He was the ninth of nine brothers. Every other brother got to go to school. So he was the one to, to college. He was the one that did not get to go, but he was called the question mark growing up. He has so many questions, but because he didn't get to go to college to get some of those answers, he had to go out and seek the answers to for himself. And so he read Emerson. He loved Emerson. He said after reading Emerson, it was like taking a drink of water. He understood it so well, dived into it. He read Whitman. He studied with the teacher of teachers, which is Emma Curtis Hopkins, who studied with Mary Baker Eddy. And many of you may know the Mary Baker Eddy name, even before Emma Curtis Hopkins, Mary Baker Eddy, the founder of Christian Sciences. And so he studied this, this idea that with consciousness, we can heal. We can heal our bodies, we can heal our conditions, we can heal the world. That idea came from a man named Phineas Parkhurst Quimby. I love his name, Phineas Parkhurst Quimby. It's so fun to say. I'm glad I don't have kids because there one of them will be named Phineas if I could get that past my partner. <laughs> and she'd be like, no, that ain't happening. So Quimby studied the science of mental health. And in his studies, he actually helped heal Mary Baker Eddy. And she took those studies and developed Christian science. And they had an idea that you don't need anything else to heal yourself. Well, Dr. Holmes expanded on, on that idea and said that if everything is God, which we believe it's all God, then that means that the doctor is God, that the medicine is God. That, you know, so if you need to, he'll tell you, if you need to take a pill, take a pill, but do your consciousness work. Think about this. You cut your finger, it heals itself. What is that? Now, if you go around and dig in that wound, it's not going to heal. That's what we do with our negative thoughts around our lives. We dig into the wound. But if we let it go and allow it, it will heal. 
So if we allow the divine presence, this is Science of Mind 101, if you allow the divine presence within you to simply surrender to that, your life can improve. It is done unto you. What did the great wayshower tell us? It is done unto you as you believe. So Dr. Holmes came to California where his brother, uh, Fenwick Holmes, was working and began uh, lecturing about uh, these new ideas that he had. Wasn't getting very far with it. So he got himself a job working for the Parks Department in Venice. And while he was working there in procurement, he would read all these different books. He'd be on his desk and his boss said, what is all this that you're reading? So his boss sat down, he started talking to him about it. The boss says, hey, come over to my house for dinner and I'll invite some friends and you tell them about it. And that turned into another invitation and another invitation. And pretty soon the guy known as Happy Holmes was running around speaking all over the town in places like Beverly Hills or the Wilshire Ebell and sharing his thoughts in the Wiltern and sharing his thoughts to sold out crowds. Eventually he wrote a book in 1926. It was called The Science of Mind. This is the original text that was then upgraded in 1938 by a woman named Maud Latham. Kind of the way the Bible was, <laughs> the teachings of Jesus were spread, not by Jesus, but by those who followed him. And so here, and not, not comparing, not saying Dr. Holmes is Jesus, so don't, don't get it twisted. I'm just drawing some analogies here. So Maud Latham developed this more extensive text called the Science of My Textbook. And this is our teaching tool. Uh, sometimes it has been, it has been uh, leather bound with gold lettering. So it looks very biblical. <laughs> Sidebar, anybody who's here from my community knows that I tell, I to go on tangents sometimes. I was sitting in my car one day and John, are you timing? Do I have a time here? I should be off by 7.30 or something or what, what is my time flow? Yeah, you're... 7.35. Okay, good. All right, I, I, I'll keep an eye on it. I'll keep an eye on it. So I'm sitting in my car and I'm reading out of my science of my textbook, which has like the gold. You know, so if you're to see somebody reading this or letter about, what do you think? They're reading the Bible, right? Guy comes up to me and says, so uh, has, has, has Jesus saved your life? And I said, yeah. And he goes, that's good. But what he didn't understand is that we had a different understanding of what it means to have Jesus save your life. The teachings that are distilled in this book have shifted and changed my life in beautiful ways. Um, so here's this guy, Happy Holmes, who's speaking at all these different places and developing this thing. And he finally had a radio show and a TV show. It was called This Thing Called Life. And uh, the TV show was in the 40s and the 50s. And at the time, they didn't have the kind of videotaping that they do today. They taped on something called a kinescope. What they would do is they take a camera and point it at the monitor and record the monitor. And we only have one copy of that left of Dr. Holmes doing that. So I'm going to share a little bit of him so you can see who this guy is that founded the Science of Mind. Um, the, the video is 30 minutes long. I'm not going to show you 30 minutes of it. And he goes on and on and on. What I did was I went back into the video and I edited myself into it so that I could turn it into a conversation between the two of us. So I'm going to go into this share screen mode and share about five or six minutes of, of Dr. Holmes. You can see this guy that turns so many people on that is responsible for 500 uh, centers around the world called the Centers for Spiritual Living, formerly called the United Church of Religious Science. Here is Dr. Holmes and me. Today on This Thing Called Life, a Zoom conversation with Dr. Ernest Holmes. Dr. Ernest Holmes, founder of the Science of Mind, Dean of the Institute of Religious Science. I could talk to him for hours, but what I want to talk to him about for today is a little bit about this thing he loves to say that there is a power for good in the universe and we can use it. My readings and my studies of his studies of the Vedas, the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita, the Talmud, the New Testament, distilled it all together into this fantastic teaching. And he speaks a lot about what he says is one of the greatest teachers we've ever known. 
He's talking about the man from Bethlehem, Jesus of Nazareth, known as the Messiah. This master mind was talking about a spiritual power in the universe, something so close to us that it is indeed nearer than our hands and feet, closer to us than our very neck brain, as the old Talmud said. Okay, there's a power for good that works for me as I believe. Got it. But is this power available to everyone and is it easily accessible to all? This power is not something we have to go in search after. It is something that is right here, close, nearer than our very breath. The way you describe this power, close, intimate, applicable, practical, but how do we use it? How do I make it applicable and practical in my life? Certainly we should have to use it in an intimate way. And we would certainly have to believe that the power exists. It's for us, not against us. It is willing and not reluctant. Can't simply say it willy-nilly. I have to believe in this power. We should actually have to believe that it really is done unto us as we believe then we would have to believe. What is belief, anyway? These are the things I want to discuss with you tonight, how it is that we could use this power for good, greater than we are, wonderful. The thing the whole world wants more than anything else in the world, the thing that you and I have for the taking, for the asking, for the using power that responds to us according to our conviction in it. Seems we're not always aware we're using this power of which you speak, yet we use it every day. This power is really how we make our way in the world. It's simply the way that we have every experience. Right where we are. How close and how intimate such a power is. And how wonderful it is just to believe that we're going to learn how to use it. Great. So break it down for us. First of all, just what it is. Then we're going to talk about how to use it. Then we are going to actually get right down and use it in our everyday life. Okay, let's get started. First of all, the power that is bigger than you are and greater than I am is, of course, a spiritual power. You're talking about a, a spiritual power. What do you mean, spiritual power? We mean something that is invisible, of course. We don't see it. We don't touch it. We don't taste it. We don't handle it. We don't weigh it. We don't measure it. But we do feel it. Just as you feel beauty just as you feel love, just as you feel anything in life. You constantly affirm that this is a power for good. And what I think you've discovered and what you're explaining to us is that we don't have to beg, plead, or beseech this power. It responds to us if we have faith and confidence in it. Now throughout all the ages, people of course have prayed and their prayers have been answered. They have prayed with faith. It doesn't make any particular difference what kind of a religion they have had. That power has responded to everyone in the way he has used it. And that is why Jesus said, very simply, very directly, it is done unto you as you believe. So there he is. It is done unto you as you believe. And that's the, that's the central feature of what we teach in the science of mind. So we teach not what to think, but how we might think, how we might use our consciousness and our conscious connection to this invisible power that he speaks of. It's an optimistic way of looking at life. It's a self-reliant way of looking at life. We don't believe we need a mediator between ourselves and spirit because we are the emanations of spirit. So it's, uh, um, it works for, for many people, and I'm so grateful that it's the 
as the Father, as the Wayshower tells us, as Joshua tells us, there are many mansions in my Father's house. I go to prepare a table for you. Sitting at one of the tables is Dr. Ernest Holmes and the Science of Mind teachings. And we uh, welcome anyone to come and, and practice with us. Now you may hear, even in my own speech, we, we are part of an organization called the Centers for Spiritual Living. We teach the science of mind. We consider ourselves religious scientists. And so back to that thing I was saying before about science of mind, we are studying how spirit works in our lives through our belief systems. Um, so what else I was going to tell you about the science of mind and spirit. Our organization is, uh, we like to kind of like, because <laughs> we were, we split back in the 1950s into two organizations, one called Religious Science International, one called United Church of Religious Science. And in 2010, we came back together. And as far as we know, we're one of the few, if maybe the only denomination that has ever split and reunited. And so when you are part of an organization that teaches oneness, what better way to practice what you preach than to take your two and turn them back into one? And when we did that, we changed our name to the Centers for Spiritual Living so that we can center ourselves in spirit, live from a centered spiritual place, but also radiate outward from our center, this spiritual practice of life. So we are both breathing in and breathing out, uh, find, finding ourselves in this general flow of spirit. We also have a monthly magazine. It's been printed since this is in, we're in our 90th, we're approaching our 100th year of the Science of Mind uh, Daily Living Guide. And each month it comes out and here in our April month, there he goes, Tommy Ruiz, the four agreements. My goodness, let's see if I can remember off the top of my head. Always do your best, be impeccable with your word. Don't take things personally and don't make any assumptions. Whew, I remembered them. That's incredible. The front of the magazine features uh, one day, Dr. Holmes was invited to a radio show and he was asked, what do you believe? And he sat down and he scratched out the statement, which we now call our Declaration of Principles, called What We Believe. So I'm going to read this to you. It's got, and remember, you got to remember now, Dr. Holmes was a wordy kind of guy and it was back in the 1920s. And so we were a lot more um, versed in the languages, including our own. If you took a test from 1930 junior high school, I doubt many of us could pass that test today. <laughs> you know, it's very, very different than what's going on. But here you go. This is Dr. Holmes, what we believe. We believe in God, the living spirit almighty, one indestructible, absolute, and self-existent cause. This one manifests itself in and through all creation but is not absorbed by its creation. The manifest, uni the manifest universe, the manifest universe is the body of God. It is the logical necessary outcome of the infinite self knowingness of God. So basically we're saying there's just the one life and that life is the life that is God, right? We believe in the individualization of the spirit in us and that all people are individualizations of the one spirit. Very careful language right here. Not individuals, but individualizations. There's only the one that gets specialized as you, as John, as Curtis and Debbie and Dr. Os Oski, Oskoki, Oskoi and Kathy and Kent and Stacy and Susan and Wendy. All of us are individualized of the one. And because of that, we're all connected as the one. That's what this is saying. We believe in the eternality, the immortality, and the continuity of the individual soul forever and ever expanding. So we each have our individual soul that is eternal, and it is always growing and evolving to higher and higher realms. And now we're seeing science telling us that there are many different planes of existence, many we don't see. Uh, there could be as many as 11 or 12, and we can find out more. Who knows? So we are always evolving uh, in many different ways. We, we believe that heaven is within us and that we experience it to the degree that we become conscious of it. Quick example, you're on your way to work, you're, miss, you're late, you've raced out into your car, you get on the freeway, you're backed up and you, you're banging on the steering wheel. You are living in a consciousness that is like 
in a hot place where they do not serve lemonade with ice, okay? Or you're in this, you look over next to you, here's a guy in his car, he's kicked back, you know, he's, he's sipping on his Starbucks or coffee bean, he's listening to his favorite audio book, he's got plenty of time. He's living in the state of consciousness called heaven. It's all how we think about, how we prepare ourselves, right? We believe the ultimate goal of life to be a complete freedom from all discord of every nature, and that this goal is sure to be attained by all. This is why we believe in the, in the work of the community, so that we can heal the discord in the world, because it's not supposed to be there. We are born free of so much pain that we learn throughout life, and this teaching helps us to get rid of that. We believe in the unity of all life, that the highest God and the innermost God is one God. We believe that God is personal to all who feel this indwelling presence. We must all have an intimate relationship with the divine. It's not, it's not a God out there. It's a God everywhere that resides within us as we connect with it through our consciousness. When Jesus says, go into your house and pray in secret, where is the only place that you can pray in secret? It's right in here. You know, the, the, um, the mystical stories that talk about the, the guy that gives the, the fruit to the three um, disciples and says, I want you to go and eat this fruit when you're all by yourself. One guy goes out into the forest and eats his fruit. The other guys go into a deep cave to eat his fruit. The third guy comes back the next day. He still has his fruit. He says, no matter where I went, no matter where I went, I felt this presence because he had an innermost divine experience. So he was never alone because God resided within him. So he did not eat his fruit alone because he was never alone. That's the journey. That's where we all get to be. We believe in the direct revelation of truth through our intuitive and spiritual nature that anyone may become a revealer of truth who lives in close contact with the indwelling God. When you have that infinite presence, you allow yourself to open up to a beingness, to a knowingness beyond what you think you know. You know, the more I know and the more I know, I know the less. But when I know the divine within, I know more. That's this, this, this is telling. We believe that the universal spirit, which is God, operates through a universal mind, which is the law of God, and that we are surrounded by this creative mind, which receives the direct impress of our thoughts and acts upon it. We believe that just as there are physical laws, there are spiritual laws. And so we can apply those spiritual laws in our life as we believe in them, okay? We believe in the healing of sick and the control of conditions through the power of this mind. If you're feeling sick, you go to bed at night and you tell your body, okay, little general germs, get out of here. All you healing, all you healing modalities within my body, get to work tonight and do your job. <laughs> You'll feel better in the morning when your body cooperates. Why do you, you know, this is why I tell, when I call a doctor's office and they put me on hold right away, I call back and I say, hey, you know, healing begins when you pick up the phone. Healing begins everywhere and it starts in our consciousness, right? Um, we believe in the eternal goodness, the eternal loving kindness, and the eternal givingness of life to all. Life will not be denied. Back to my freeway analogies. I love freeway analogies as much as I love nature analogies. When you're in that stop and go traffic and you look down into the crack on the 405, grass is growing there. Traffic is driving by at 70 and 80 miles an hour when there's not stop and go. And the grass is growing in the crack because life will not be denied. We believe in our own soul, our own spirit, and our own destiny. For we understand that the life of all is God. Those are the things that we believe. In short, we have lots of classes. We teach classes all the time uh, and we practice what we teach. And that's why we are called practitioners of the science of mind. That's a lot in a little bit, but that's, there's a lot to this as there is to every faith. So come visit us anytime. We're on Erringer Road right there uh, behind the Montessori School. So right across from Bob Huber's office. Everybody knows where Bob's office is. Okay. Thank you, John. Thank you, everyone. All right, let's let's start with some questions. I'm going to go to the Q and A, and let's see what we got here. Uh, I truly believe in not needing any mediator to pray and connect with one and only God, the Creator of all that is on earth and heavens. I I I I affirm that statement as absolutely true. I believe in that as well, and uh, you know. 
what more can you say? You 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 said it all there, Doc. I I I want to try and get your name right, Doctor O Ascoi. Is that it? Ascoi, Ascoi. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. And I'm I'm happy to see that you that you follow that. And I think that uh, we find science is proving that all the time. So uh, it's time now for science and religion to come back to, together uh, after a multiple thousand year split that began with the great enlightenment in some ways i think the great enlightenment was the great endarkenment and so it's wonderful to be in a new enlightenment where we have uh, the analogies and the, the you know brian swim the cosmologist brian swim uh says that that uh, the human kind is stardust that has become conscious of itself that can ask the questions that stars always wanted to ask and we're asking the questions and we're finding the answers. And it's really great to see that happen in our lifetime. Beautiful. You mentioned that there's 500 centers around the world. Um, how many different countries, primarily in the United States or? China? Yeah, yeah, gosh, I used to know that answer about how many countries, uh, primarily in the United States and Canada. Um, the many in Europe, uh, Africa, um, on every continent, for sure, there is a Science Mind Center. And there, remember I mentioned Fenwick, Dr. Holmes's brother. Dr. Holmes's brother Fenwick met a man um, named Tanakuchi, I believe his name is now, it was, in Japan. And they studied together and developed a sect of religious science called Shino Loe. And it has over a million adherents in Japan. They teach the science of mind and spirit. They have their own name. I say, I'm not going to try and say it again. I said it right the first time, and I'm, I'm happy that I got it right that time. <laughs> but so, yeah, uh, primarily United States centered. Many of the centers are a lot of centers in California, but uh, and in Canada and, and in Mexico. Uh, we're fast growing in Latin America. Uh, we've just developed, we just opened up a, a school in, uh, in Latin America for our Spanish speaking. Uh, persons and uh, we also have a center in two centers in China even as well in Shanghai and uh, I forget the other city but I know there's one in Shanghai. Mm -hmm. Fantastic now in terms of um, uh, other faiths like um, we celebrate Christmas we have other faiths that celebrate uh, Hanukkah or Yom Kippur are there certain annual events or things that the Center for Spiritual Living uh, practice and, and celebrate? Yeah, well, we we celebrate all of the Christian holidays because we are, you know, this this book that I showed you, half of the book is the teachings of Jesus. We don't, some don't consider us a Christian denomination, but we are a Christian-based denomination in much of our teachings. So, yeah, Christmas, Easter, all the all the Christmas all the Christian holidays, but because we also have a strong interfaith uh, community, we also celebrate Passover and Rosh Hashanah and uh, many of the Jewish holidays. We we share with our Islamic brothers and we do Ramadan and fasting and uh, we uh, we embrace all kinds, not to the point of appropriation, but of respect and of acknowledgement that there are many pathways to God and what you may need, we want to help support that for you. Because again, Beautiful. we're not telling you what to teach, what to think, we're just hope, hopefully to open up how you may think. Okay. How many practitioners do you have here in Simi Valley? We have eight at our center. Wonderful. Um, and then in this spirituality, is there an afterlife? that's interesting there is um well dr holmes clearly believed in an afterlife he believed in when he was passing on he made his transition he was excited to go and see his hazel on the other side but what is central to what we believe is that uh there is no um death there is transition to another plane of existence. There is eternal life ever unfolding. And uh, part of our individualized expression allows an individualized interpretation of what the afterlife is. My own personal belief is that 
I don't know, because this is where I am. And this is the life that I must leave, live to the fullest. What I am convinced of, again, on a personal note, this is not uh, doctrinal or dogmatic from the science of mind teaching, but I've, <laughs> I'm, I'm always struck by all the avatars, saints, prophets, and wisdom teachers of all time who have had the good fortune to transition over to the other side and to travel back to this side. I don't know any of them who set up residence and stuck around. So whatever was happening over there, they go back. And I have sat alongside many people and have been able to be a midwife to the experience of death for many people. And I've seen a serenity and I've seen some close their eyes and open them up and say, I'm, I'm going to be okay. It's going to be all right. It's beautiful over there. And they close their eyes and they don't come back here. So I don't know, but I'm not concerned about finding out because I think it's okay. And just a follow up on that would be, is there any difference between being buried versus cremated no. or? Okay. Okay. Just, just asking. Um, do you meet together on a specific day and time? We meet on Sundays at 1030. We also meet on Wednesdays at seven o'clock. We have classes throughout the week. We have practitioners who are available for prayer any time of the day. We invite and encourage daily spiritual practice on a regular basis. My personal encouragement is that people do their spiritual practice in the morning. So there's something happens and they don't get to do it in the morning. They get another chance to do it that night so they can get it done that day. Is there a, um, a daily was it one o'clock or one thirty event happening? Oh yeah, <laughs> I yeah I started when we went into the into uh, COVID house arrest. I began doing a one o'clock thing on Facebook called Oneness at One, and it began as an idea of just holding the community together, and it slowly has become truly a practice of oneness. So at one o'clock we do a one a reset. I go on for about ten minutes on Facebook and talk about various things. This month it's National Poetry Month, so I've been reading uh, sacred poetry and i believe that all poetry is sacred because i believe that everything is sacred there's no separation between sacred and profane except in the mind um and so we we uh, explore different concepts throughout the throughout the month at one o'clock yeah thanks Beautiful. john and i've seen you there sometimes yeah. exactly exactly all right uh stacy asked would you explain your perspectives on people with severe illnesses and terminal illnesses if the mind can heal you how are terminal illnesses even death explained yeah, that's beautiful. That's a great question. And it is it is highly perplexing. But you got to remember, if we're talking about that, there is only the one life and that life cannot, you know, we, we know that energy can't be destroyed, it can only be transformed. So to have an experience where we think that a healing and a cure are, are synonymous, may be an errant thought. This is not to um, over explain or to justify or try to make things not be what they are. Let me be very frank. Death is painful for those who, may, who are left behind. It's painful sometimes for those who are going through the experience. It hurts. That's true. And sometimes a healing might be the transition. You know, we are, we are, um, individualized of an infinite intelligence. So our ability to know versus infinity is, is quite minute, right? So sometimes we have to throw faith into the mix and trust beyond our physical uh, and mental limitations to see that a release to the other side may indeed be a healing, but it doesn't necessarily look like a cure. If I understand it right, then faith and belief is central to your beliefs. I mean, it just, I mean, it's just, it's over empowering, right? Yeah. Okay. It, yeah, it is. Uh, what do you see? Curtis, this is Curtis asking, what do you see as the biggest spiritual challenge we currently face? <sighs> It's a really, it's, it's really a simple answer. 
it's to recognize the oneness of humanity. It's to recognize that there is a human race. Even beyond that, there is a life that we reside upon that is called Earth. I love the Gaia theory. The planet itself is alive. How many of us can go out on a beautiful moonlit night and not be struck by it? How many of us can taste the tastiest strawberry and not be amazed at its lusciousness? How many of you right now are not gonna salivate when I mention lemon, squeezed and cut? So we are, our biggest spiritual challenge is to understand the interconnectedness and the interdependence of all life upon each other. We all walked out of the ocean, the trees, the plants, the animals, all of us came from the sea. Beautiful. Okay. Uh, do, Lorraine asks, do, you, do members of your faith practice meditation or positive affirmations? Both. Easy. Yep. That's a softball. Thank you. Yeah, we both. We really believe it's very important. What is the, what it what it what was what was the, the what did Moses hear when he asked, who is this talking to me? I am that I am. It's very important in our teaching what follows I am. If you are un, I am unworthy, I am nothing, I am sad, I am depressed, I am oh, cascade of negative feelings. I am empowered. I am the divine. I am God expressed in the world. I am powerful. These words are important. Affirmations are powerful. And sometimes we affirm things we don't believe about ourselves. So we also teach something called an affirmation. So if I say I am prosperous, but then I think about my bank account doesn't show the amount of money that I'd like it to show. Then, it, then I ask the question, how is it that I am so easily prosperous? I turn the affirmation to a question. The brain likes to answer questions, right? Science of mind. So the brain, the, the micro mind and the macro mind. How is it that I am so prosperous? Well, I'm on right now watching on Facebook on my laptop. I, I, uh, I'm sitting in my hands. I just finished a, a lovely meal. I paid all my bills last month. Uh, I have a job. So we begin to answer the questions that prove that the affirmation is correct for ourselves. And then we center ourselves in meditation to recognize the gap, the divine presence, the God awareness place, the center of between all thoughts and ideas. Beautiful. Here's, it says, not a question, just a thank you, Reverend Stephen. I so enjoy listening to you. Oh, thank Next you. question. Yeah, no problem. Uh, what is the role of prayer at the Center for Spiritual Living? Prayer is what we call, we call prayer treatment. We have a, a, a form of prayer. It's a, it's a method of prayer because we don't, uh, see, we believe in the self-givingness of God, right? So we believe that everything is here for us. If you, one of my things to mention all the time is that we live in an infinite universe, right? So if we live in an infinite universe, that means that everything is already there. In infinity, everything already exists. So we must bring ourselves into an attraction of that. We must affirm and grab on to uh, our good. And so we teach a form of prayer that anchors our consciousness in that attractive space. We begin with recognition. There's only the one life that is God. We unify that life. I and God are one. The Father and I are one. Then we realize our good. I am living a prosperous, joyous life. A prosperous and joyous life exists, and I claim mine now. I give thanks. That's the recognition. The third, fourth step is thank you. Not thank you, God. No, I give thanks for the awareness of this truth. I give thanks for my alignment to this truth. And then, because it's true, I don't have to worry about it now. So I release and I let it go. And then I live it. Then I, then suddenly I'm walking, walking down the street and it shows up. I don't know if we got a quick, really quick story about a lady who was trying to, she needed a car because she was going to get to work late. And she affirmed, I really need a car. She went to a practitioner and said, well, why do you need a car? Well, because I get to work late and by the bus, I always miss the bus and the bus driver's not on time. And if I, then if I get, get on time, the boss is going to fire me. And they started praying that, that, that affirming that she arrived on time, in time, and there was no worry about travel because it was easy, because travel is easy. There's a, there's a principle of easy travel in the universe, and that travel principle is yours. 
A couple weeks later, she was looking on the board at work. Somebody moved out of their apartment. They lived down the block. She rented that apartment. The rent was cheaper. She was two blocks from her house. She didn't need a car. She got to work on time every day. It wasn't that she needed a car. She believed she needed a car. But when, to, with the help of the practitioner, she learned that all she really needed to do was to recognize that there's this principle called easy travel, and it is mine. And boom, there she was, a block, two blocks from work. Beautiful. That's a good story. Uh, Lorraine, I think she's throwing another softball here. Do you believe in miracles happening on Earth today? Everything is a miracle. <laughs> I just, you know, we call, I have a wonderful friend, Michelle Madrano, who calls them normicles. Normicles. They're, it's, 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 all, it's, all, it's all a miracle. The fact that you, Lorraine, are even here is a mathematical miracle. All of the, the thousands of sperms and the one egg that comes together that your parents met each other that they it, out of all the billions of people on the planet that they came together and that you are now here it's all a miracle that's how you see it you want to see it as something less than that maybe you take some of the joy out of life beautiful all right here we go uh this is a timely one because of the day if the earth is for humanity how shall we be treating Earth? Who is vibrant and alive? I'm, we're asking this question as today is Earth Day. Yeah, I'm wearing, this is my shirt in honor of Earth Day too. Yeah, you know what? I, I, I question the beginning of that premise though, that Earth is not actually for humanity. Earth is for life. Earth is alive and humanity happens to be one of the things on Earth that is alive. Now, because we have this level of consciousness that we have, because we can, uh, as Elizabeth Eric Browning says, because we can see art, you know, like when the, when the bee is taking the pollen out of the, out of the flower, it's just taking pollen out of the flower. But we look at that and we see art. We might even take out our pins, our colorful pins and paint the picture and turn it into a piece of art. So because we have this level of responsibility, we, get, we have to use that and become that miracle maker that Lorraine was talking about and, 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 and have a level of responsibility, which is really that we are response able. We are able to respond to the call of this planet that is alive, that is screaming at us. Please take better care of me. I'm choking, I'm choking. I'm bleeding in my rivers. You know, my, my hair is on fire, literally, as the forests are burning. So you're gonna ignore that? If you were walking by a burning building and a mother was out in front holding one baby, screaming that her other baby was inside, Instinctively, you would run in there and help her get that baby out of there. But we don't do that for the baby mother earth that we live upon. What's up with us? So, yeah, yeah. And the, the life's alive, so it ain't human kind of thing. If we, if we die, something else. If we extinct ourselves, life will ask the dinosaurs. They're gone, we're still here. That can happen to us. Beautiful. Now, I've, I've been to a couple of the uh, uh, services there at the Center for Spiritual Living and know that there's uh, a lot of music involved. Mm. E even so, uh, uh, Cantor Mark involved quite a bit, but uh, just a little tidbit on sharing us how music p plays into your practices. I, I, I think that music is part of the spiritual practice. I think that music touches the soul in a way uh, that very few other things, like, like, like that beautiful piece of art, like that lovely piece of nature, music sings the spirit. It sings to the spirit and it is, there's, uh, it's, um, it's essential to the sharing of the message at our center. And it's also part of the joy. We call ours a, a worship celebration. So we worship the divine and we celebrate it too. And music is part of that celebration. Fantastic. Well, I think we're wrapping things up. Uh, what I want to do now is uh, have us show up the uh, next month's event. We're doing this on a monthly basis. Uh, and next month, we're going to have a panel discussion on the Baha'i faith. And uh, again, very wonderful people who you know, live amongst us here in Simi Valley, where it may be a little difference of uh, practice spiritually, but yet the, the beliefs and the practices and the things we want to get done are a lot similar. And 
Uh, we're going to have a great experience on May 27th, 7 o'clock. Uh, it'll be a Zoom like we're doing here. And uh, I, I, again, I want to say thank you to Reverend Rambo. Thank you so very much for sharing with us tonight. Uh, the excitement and energy that you exude is, is evident. And uh, share with us again, uh, Haywood and Erringer is the location. Yes. Uh, behind John's Bagel Deli, if that's a landmark, if that's a possibility. Next, next to Teresa's. There you go. Okay, you're right. There you go. And adjacent adjacent just to south. the Teresa's. Yeah, just just center. south. Uh -huh. And then um, Sundays. Sundays at 1030. We have meditation for 20 minutes at 10 o'clock. And we'll be going back into our building in late June. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and currently, maybe via internet? Yes, uh, you can you can watch us on Sundays uh, on our Facebook pages and also on YouTube. But it's easiest if you just uh, you got my name there. You just go to my name on Facebook and uh, it's right there. Or you can go to the CSL community page or Center for Spiritual Living Simi Valley. Look up any of those three, my name or the center's name, and you'll find a Facebook page with us. And you'll find us on there Sundays at ten thirty. And, and hopefully there may be in the chat. Uh, your contact information, email, phone number. Oh, and, great, great. And then uh, again, thank you all for joining us. Share with your uh, friends and family this monthly event. This has been recorded. So if, if uh, somebody has not seen it, they can watch it uh, either on our YouTube channel or uh, maybe on Facebook later also. So again, thank you all for joining us. Uh, we'll see you next month uh, and have a great evening.